Fantastic fun time because I I'm excited because I get to talk to you about something I never get to talk to anybody about in <laughs> my circle of friends and sure. uh, it's something that started me off on my sci-fi adventure yes. and that's the Twilight Zone. Indeed, 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 and, indeed. And you are considered one of the foremost experts on the Twilight. Yeah, Zone. yeah, I'm the I'm the world's expert on the Twilight Zone. I was. Uh, I started working on the Twilight Zone Companion when I was like 21 or 22, and uh, with the exception of Rod Serling, who had died two years earlier, and Charles Beaumont, one of the other writers, everyone else was still around. So I got to interview all the producers, all the major directors, the stars, everything, the DP. It was great, and um, the book's never been out of print since. Wow, yeah, because you, you, you wrote the Twilight Zone Companion. I think you have different volumes at this point, right? We're on the third. The third edition just came out last year, and it has another hundred pages of material and five hundred new photos and links to audio and video rarities. So it's pretty cool. And uh, and I've also produced every, produced and or written every uh, home video version of the Twilight Zone from the VHS to the uh, Blu-rays. So. <laughs> wow. So yeah, if I'm this is the one Twilight Zone. This is the only Twilight Zone conversation I ever need to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But, uh, but it was, it was, it was the way I taught myself how to be a writer, producer, in television. That when I got out of college, there was no graduate school in that, and so I thought, well, let's study one of the greatest TV shows ever made and see what I can learn. And by the time I was twenty-two or twenty-three, I was writing for television, so uh, so it all worked out. But I, and I also, you know, got mentored by some wonderful people like George Clayton Johnson and Ted Sturgeon and. On and on, Harlan Ellison, you know, they were, I mean, people who had written for Star Trek and Twilight Zone and Outer Limits, and those are the three shows that made me want to be a writer. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, the Twilight Zone inspired me and led me down the path to Star Trek, actually. Yes. I, I started with the Twilight Zone as, as a very young child. I, I probably understood a, a fraction of what was going on, but of course I've kept it up throughout uh, the rest of my life go back and now I understand a lot more of what was being said, the social commentary, uh, things like that. And that, and then Star Trek, I saw a lot of episodes. I was like, Ooh, it's kind of a twilight zone episode. And that's with every Star Trek series and me, I'm the Orville guy. I see twilight zone influence with, a, within a lot of episodes yeah. in the Orville as well. So yeah. everyone's still, you know, you had shows like black mirror, which is basically yeah. a modern day twilight zone. No. And well, uh, what started you off with the Twilight Zone? It was, you know, when I was a kid, from when I was really little, I loved science fiction. And uh, so it is Twilight Zone. I only saw two episodes during the original run of the show because I was a little kid. And um, one, uh, when we were visiting um, a friend's house, my mom, and it was uh, an episode called Long Moral with Robert Lansing. Mm -hmm. And then another time, um, I was up past my bedtime, uh, and my stepfather had two TVs in the garage, one that just got sound and one that just got picture, and they were on different channels usually. And that night, for some reason, uh, Twilight Zone was on. It was the hour episodes, and it was a uh, death ship. And I had no idea what, what, it, what show it was. I had no idea who the actors were. Well, I was just blown away by it, of course. And then uh, after Twilight Zone went off network, it was syndicated on KTLA here in L.A., and it would run five days a week in the afternoon around 3, 3.30. So when I came home from school, I would watch Twilight Zone, and, uh, and it was just such a great show. And by then, of course, as you mentioned, Star Trek started airing, and... Uh, and I was just totally um, blown away by that show. And, uh, and I noticed that a lot of the writers on, credited on both those shows and on The Outer Limits were the same writers who were writing all the books that I loved, you know, uh, uh, Ted Sturgeon and Richard Matheson and Charles Beaumont and on and on. I mean, you know, and, uh, and so that was kind of my way into seeing, and Ray Bradbury even uh, wrote one episode of The Twilight Zone. And of course, Beaumont and Matheson and George Clayton Johnson were three of his protégés and he recommended them to Rod Serling. So that became the core of writers on Twilight Zone, and uh, so I just recognized that there was this depth of quality and profound insight and unique storytelling that came with these writers, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and I was just um, totally entranced. And Twilight Zone, um, I'd met George Clayton Johnson uh, when I was a teenager, and we became friends. He also wrote the first episode of, Twi of Star Trek that ever aired, uh, the, the Man Trap. And he and Bill Nolan, who we recently lost, uh, co-wrote Logan's Run. 
And uh, George became a friend, and that was sort of my first idea of, well, maybe I could write this book about Twilight Zone. He was very encouraging. And, um, and as I say, it was two years after Rod Serling's death. I just got out of college with an art degree. And um, so George introduced me to people, and that led to me researching, interviewing people for three months. And then I went to Carol Serling. And, uh, and by then I knew a lot about the subject. And then she could ask people she trusted, like George or Buck Houghton or whomever, and they clearly gave me a good report because Carol then said, you have access to everything. And, uh, and Rod's house was exactly as he'd left it. Uh, the, the six Emmys were there, all the, the Peabody Awards, the Hugo Awards, the scrapbooks, there's these amazing huge leather volumes of every clipping ever written on Rod Serling, um, the scripts, the film cans of his own 16 millimeter prints. Wow. Of the episodes were in the garage. I would take home stacks of these and just put them on the projector. Many had never been even put on a projector before. And they had the original commercials, the original coming attraction spots. It was phenomenal. And so from, a, from when I started on the Twilight Zone Companion to when it came out was five years. And so I was writing for things like Smurfs and He-Man during that time, but Twilight, the Twilight Zone Companion was my main project. And, uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of it. And I have this encyclopedia of Twilight Zone in my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have so many memories of Twilight Zone. I have a hard time picking an episode. To yes. watch, you know, there's the five seasons. They're available uh, on a lot of the streaming services, and I I have a hard time because one of my favorite things growing up and even early adulthood was I believe it was the Sci-Fi Channel always had the yeah. the Twilight Zone marathon every yeah. yes yes July Fourth weekend or something like that, yeah. and I loved being yeah. served a, a roulette wheel yeah. of <laughs> random episodes. You never knew what yeah. it was going to be, yeah. uh, so I always have a hard time to go and just pick an episode or start from the beginning because I want yeah. I want it to be random. I don't know what I want to not no. know what I'm going to get. But the one that I do watch quite often is uh is the Roddy McDowell episode, People Are Alike All Over. Yes. Which yeah. um there's many favorite episodes, but that's one of my absolute favorites. Yes. And, and, and mostly because it, it uh, well I've always loved it. But then I watched the episode uh, episode two, season one episode two of the Orville yes. where uh uh, Ed and Kelly get trapped inside of an alien zoo. They were kidnapped yes. <laughs> and put into a zoo. I'm like, oh, Twilight Zone. So I make right. references back and forth. And it's just a, such yeah. a great uh, uh, idea in that original episode about, you know, the the one astronaut's like, oh, people are, don't be afraid. People are alike all over. And Roddy McDowell's like, that's the problem. People, yeah. <laughs> you can't trust people. And well, what, was, uh, what, was great, what was great about Rod was that he, wanted to use real science fiction writers and real science fiction stories. That was a short story by Paul W. Fairman, and Rod bought it, and he wrote the script, the script of it. He mm -hmm. wrote very fast. He, he would lounge by a swimming pool in the mornings and dictate into a, uh, a dictaphone, and then his secretary would type the script up, and then he'd make hand corrections. But, uh, uh, but yeah, week after week, he was doing amazing work. And Roddy McDowell, of course, that's before Planet of the Apes, mm -hmm. and... Susan Oliver is in it too. She starred in the uh, in the first pilot of Star Trek in uh, you know in the Cage, ironically. Oh yeah, and I rec yeah I recognize. Yeah. That's where I recognize her from. Yeah, and I think the Ryan girl. Yeah, and Vic Perrin, who was the voice of the Outer Limits narration, uh, is also in that episode as one of the Martians. And uh, yeah, I mean, just all of these episodes, week after week after week. And it is fun as you as you say with the roulette uh, of when you'd watch. Well, it was very funny because when I was. Um, Writing the Twilight Zone, there were like a couple episodes that would just never air on KTLA, and this is before uh, VCRs, and so you know I was tape taping them on c audio cassette off the air, and uh, and so there were two episodes that just never aired, and they weren't in syndication, and Rod didn't have copies of them, and so I called KTLA, and I said, uh, hey, I'm writing a book about Twilight Zone, and I'm just curious when you're going to air these two episodes, and the guy said, well, uh, what are they? And I said, well, I gave him the title. He said, well, we're, we'll, we'll run them next week. So, so all of Los Angeles saw those two episodes because I needed to see them. So, <laughs> <laughs> that was a sense of power. Yeah, Very and now power. you can just see them whenever you want. Yeah. You just but it's just so amazing. Up. Well, I mean, it's just so amazing that we have that great gift now that anything we want to see, you either just go online or turn on the TV or you – pull out your DVD or your Blu-ray. It's, it's a, it's a, I mean, pe younger people don't remember those times when if a show was on, that was when you watched it. And I remember when Twilight, when a, a Star Trek first ran, I recorded, I was 10 years old, I recorded it on reel-to-reel -reel tape, audio tape, 
just in case they never showed it again. Because, yeah. you know, because back then, shows sometimes would only run one season and they'd be gone and you'd never see them again. There was no way yeah. to recapture that. So, uh, so I think we live in a, in a blessed time right now because we can, see, we can see all of these wonderful things. Absolutely. And then, of course, there's, I've seen about six episodes, it's been a while, of the new Twilight Zone yeah. Yeah. Uh, with, uh, with Jordan Peele. Uh, mm -hmm. The first couple of the first two episodes, I really enjoyed, yeah. and then I then I didn't quite like the stories, the format mm -hmm. of the next couple. But then, I, then they had a one where they go uh, a team of astronauts going to Mars, and I really enjoyed that one. Uh, yeah. What's your take on on the on the new Twilight Zone? I was very disappointed because I really liked um, Get Out, and I thought um, we uh, us I guess, us, us yeah that was a really interesting um, film as well, and. And, but I think the mistake that people often make is they think that it's going to be easy mm -hmm. to come up with Twilight Zone ideas or Twilight Zone stories. And they say, well, let's do one on wife beating or let's do one on, you know, and, and that's not the way you do it. And Rod himself, Rod Serling would say, um, if I have a great ending, then I know how to write it. Yeah. But I have so many Twilight Zone ideas where I can't come up with an ending to save my life. And so that, they're never done. We don't write, I don't write them. And um, I think you've come to it with the assumption that you're going to do your absolutely best work and I don't think there are many writers who can write those kind of scripts. I think, um, you know, when, when Rod first started the original Twilight Zone, he uh, had an open, open call for uh, scripts. And uh, they, they read, they, I think they got 5,000 submissions, of which they read 500, and they were all crap. Mm -hmm. And so then he called Ray Bradbury up and said, what do I do? And Ray said, come over to the house. And he said, here, he pulled uh, four books from his shelf in his basement uh, office, and he said, uh, read these, and then let's talk. And one was by uh, John Collier, who was a British fantasy writer. One was by Ray himself. One was by Charles Wellman. And one was by Richard Matheson. And so Serling ended up using uh, uh, all, all of those writers. He bought a story from Collier that he adapted. And, uh, and Matheson and Beaumont became the major writers on Twilight Zone. So mm -hmm. but because they were, they were a rarity, which was, and as was Ray, which were writers who could write horror, science fiction and fantasy and could also write tv scripts mm -hmm. and you need all of those skills to be able to do this and um uh but it was a rare rare breed then and i think it's a rare breed now and uh so yeah i was disappointed in jordan peele's uh show i think if he had made it his solo project and really brought his full attention and 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 ability to bear it might have been a great show but i think mm -hmm. it was a lost opportunity uh as it was so um you know we're we're we're, uh, we're preparing to pitch a new Rod Serling show ourselves uh, as part of the showrunners network. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, Rod dictated all of his scripts, and uh, they thought that those dictation belts were lost. And they and they were um, uh, not just his scripts, but letters, everything, speeches. And Rod had a very distinctive and unique way of speaking. And uh, so they've recently found a thousand hours of them, and uh, in two college archives. And so. I'm proposing a new show called Rod Serling's After Twilight that would, use, that would actually have Rod narrate the show from those uh, recordings. And also, oh, wow. he would take scripts that Rod wrote but that never got made, or scripts that he wrote in the live uh, TV era that haven't been seen since, and, and make those, as well as scripts by some of the other writers from Twilight Zone, as well as scripts by some of the great writers of the modern era, mm -hmm. you know, like, like Neil Gaiman or N.K. Jemison or wh whomever we, we reach out to. And uh, so I'm now in conversations with the Serling. Um, uh, estate and the Sterling family to see if we can make this happen. But uh, I think it'd be really fun. And and my friend Joe Dougherty, who was executive producer on Pretty Little Liars for seven years, and he's an Emmy winner and all sorts of stuff. Um, he's he's aboard on that project as well with me. So you know, it's it's fun. Well, that would be amazing. That'd be like a true yes. getting more Twilight Zone from Rod Sterling himself. Yes. And yes. Uh, there's I I would say there's something to be said about the the era that the original Twilight Zone came in when it comes to the writing, the, the constraints yeah. of the time. You couldn't just yeah. say what you wanted to say. You had to find a way to maneuver around, around the censors. And, you know, if you had a certain message that, you know, the, the networks might say, hey, that's a little too hardcore yeah. for the audience. So they had to find different ways to, to convey their messages. Whereas nowadays, you can say exactly what you want to say. No one's going to give you any grief. Well, maybe the internet yeah. will, but the studios yeah. will be fine with it. So uh, there's something to be said. It's just like with a movie with a huge budget compared mm -hmm. to a movie with a small budget. The small budget usually has the better script and the better characters because yes. uh, yes. they're, they're trying to work yeah. through it. 
Well, I think I think but the the point that you're making also is that you need to have some you need to have something to say. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't. I yeah. mean, a lot of writers don't. And I think I think something that's not noted very often, but is really important, is that a lot of the people who worked on Twilight Zone, including Serling and Richard Matheson and directors like Doug Hayes and so forth, they went through World War II. I mean, you know, people yeah. don't remember that, Ro that Gene Roddenberry was a was a was a B, uh, you know he's a what is it, B-17, B-24 B pilot? I mean, he, you know, these guys, I mean, Rod Serling was in the paratroops. He'd jump out of an airplane into a jungle filled with people trying to kill him. And yeah. and these were guys in their teens and early 20s. These were, I, I refer to them as young old men because they were so, they had been through so much and yeah. it was so, they had seen life and death. They knew, um, they had deep, many of them had PTSD, including mm -hmm. Serling. And, and they had a lot to get off their chest. And I think that that depth of, experience and that depth of needing to say these things um having seen great injustice great inhumanity i think it shaped them where they had they were they had a great depth of insight and depth of soul and i think that also helped enormously um you know so uh so i think that's part of it too yeah being confronted with your own mortality in real time in real life uh will give you something to think about and have something to say and see yes. the world in a different way yeah, so, well, Rod, well, Rod told a great story of being in the uh, in the jungle uh, during World War II, and suddenly, without any warning, a Japanese soldier jumped up in front of him with his gun, his rifle aimed right at Rod, only a few feet away. And Rod knew in that moment that he was dead; that there was absolutely nothing he could do. That in that that was he saw he saw it as clearly as I'm seeing you that that was it. And fortunately, there was a soldier, an American soldier behind Rod that Rod was unaware of, who killed the Japanese soldier before he could kill Rod. But Rod faced that moment of his own death. Rod actually experienced, um, this is it. I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a goner. And, you know, and again, you, you just feel that in Twilight Zone when Rod is writing about death or writing, writing about war. There's a great episode he wrote called The Purple Testament that's just terrific. I mean, it's about um, men fighting in World War II, and it's probably one of the best things on World War II, if not the best thing on I've ever seen, because you just know there's the there's the grittiness and the exhaustion and the weariness and all of these qualities to it that you just know that the guy who wrote it lived it, <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, it's just it's just terrific. But um, but you know, every few years ago they bring out another version of Twilight Zone, and some ha have good episodes, but none of them have the consistency of great episodes that the original Twilight Zone had. I mean, their batting average was so amazing. And the, just, you know, when you look week after week, I mean, one week it's walking distance and the next week it's the lonely and the next week it might be Eye of the Beholder. I mean, mm -hmm. I, on and on. And, and the, the pool of actors, I mean, my God, uh, whether it's Anne Francis or Jack Klugman or James Whitmore or Bill Mooney, you know, I mean, I, you know, Bill Mooney's in Space Command and it's yeah. great work. With him. And we're working with Veronica Cart right now from the birds and alien and uh, and she was also in a great twilight zone episode called i sing the body electric the only oh, yeah. one that Sterling wrote that was produced but um you know i mean this is we're very lucky to be able to have this work that stands the test of time and and people can visit um you know 60 years later and more i mean the, the i knew that the twilight zone was going to last i have a sister who's 19 years younger than me and when she was in college she got into watching the twilight zone and and loved it as much as i do and uh and I knew then that, that Twilight Zone was really going to be one of the uh, one of the immortal pieces of of art, you know, it, that it was going to because if someone who wasn't from my generation and didn't have the same, you know, uh, reference points, cultural reference points that I had, could still respond to that work, it would it, it meant a lot. Yeah, the stories the the original Twilight Zone uh, seasons are just so yeah. human. Yeah, so yeah. human, and even though. You're watching, you're like, oh, that's, you know, the 50s, that's the 60s. Yeah. The messages are really. timeless. Yeah, and that's the irony because, you know, Rod never intended to be a, Rod, uh, a science fiction writer by any means. He wanted to be sort of the Arthur Miller of television. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to write this heavyweight drama dealing with race, dealing with politics, dealing with social issues. And at every turn, he was censored. And he became the highest paid and, and sort of most award-winning. He won like six Emmys, a uh, writer in TV. But he was f so frustrated. And... And at one point when he'd written something about politics where he couldn't even use the phrase uh, Democrat or Republican, couldn't mm -hmm. talk about any issue of the day, he said, you know, if I if I'd put this in the 21st century and, and populated it with robots, I could have gotten my point across uh, more easily. Yeah. And I, that planted the seed in his head, and that led him to writing Twilight Zone. And he did four pilots of Twilight Zone before the show got greenlit. And, um, you know, he was doggedly determined to, uh, to get the show on the air. And... 
and but that forced him to write more universally because mm -hmm. if you're writing about Martians, you know, imprisoning, imp you know, imprisoning the first human in a zoo or whatever, these are commenting both metaphorically on his world but also on ours. Mm -hmm. And so it made his work more universal than it would have been otherwise. I think if he hadn't had Twilight Zone, if he had not had the frustrations he'd had, he probably wouldn't be remembered today because, uh, you know, a lot of the writers that he came up with, Reginald Rose and Tad Moselle, Chayefsky, uh, you know, they're not well known today. Uh, yeah. And Rod Serling, of course, everyone knows who Rod Serling is. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's when you when you take issues of the time or issues, yeah. you know, issues that humans have always dealt with and you and you try to be literal with them, it's yeah. the human instinct is to get defensive yeah. and, and not listen. But when you apply it to some other Yes. otherworldly situation you'll get people to ponder yeah. upon um you know issues that are going on and not realize that they're thinking about it well it's, it's great because science fiction allows you to not polarize and because yeah. you're not in the like if, if i say you know uh, trump's a meathead or whatever you know i'm gonna get in an argument particularly in other parts of the country but um but if i'm talking about authoritarian rule in a, it, like, for instance, if you look at The Obsolete Man, which is a great Twilight Zone episode about dictatorship and, mm -hmm. and the uh, crushing of the individual, I think people across the spectrum politically can watch that episode and understand what it's talking about and mm -hmm. why it's important to guard individual liberties and why reading and books and all of that stuff is important. And, um, you know, and, and again, I think science fiction has a great opportunity to open people's minds. You know, I, th I think it does have that quality. And uh, I'm very glad of it. You know, I think Star Trek, I mean, I was seeing episode after episode on Star Trek. I'd never seen anything like that before. Mm -hmm. And that was true of Twilight Zone, too. I mean, Eye of the Beholder is a great episode, you know, where mm -hmm. a woman's sitting in a hospital room waiting to find out if she, if, you know, if she looks normal. If she looks time. normal, which yes. we assumed was going to be beautiful. Yes. Uh, yeah. But beautiful was ugly in that world. So Very, really, yes. yeah, it's absolutely. Yes because her head's wrapped in bandages for the whole yeah. episode. And Doug Hayes, my friend Doug Hayes, who directed it, um, he cast two actors in it. There's an actress when she's under the bandages who's got a great voice and great uh, expressiveness. And then he cast Donna Douglas from Be Beverly Hillbillies before Beverly Hillbillies was on as the great beauty because he said, it's hard to find a beauty who's that great an actress. So he split the difference and it worked terrifically. And, uh, but, you know, again, there was such inventiveness and such... Um, one and, and and also with the makeup with the ugly people in that episode, mm -hmm. that was William Tuttle, and he was the great makeup man from the Time Machine and and Young Frankenstein and so forth. So he was the first makeup man to win an Oscar for uh, Seven Faces of Doctor Lau. And so he and Doug just kind of Doug talked about they got their fingers into the clay and they started working with it. And at the time, Tuttle had just done the uh, Time Machine, which used prosthetics pieces of a face for the Morlocks. And mm -hmm. Doug said, "Well, why don't we just do that?" And they came up with that pig pig nose and the uh, asymmetrical, you know, brow, and it was just, just wonderful. wonderful. Yeah, that's such a classic, such a famous episode. Even yeah. when people don't quite remember the the story, that I, I always get flashes of yeah. of, of of the reveal. Uh, yes, when they, yeah. you know, when when the doctors come in and we see their ugly faces and and uh, but when it comes to Twilight Zone, I mean, you you are an expert at Twilight Zone, but your Twilight Zone's journey is not done yet. No, you have no. more Twilight Zone uh, adventures ahead of you. Yes, I do. I do. Well, you know, it's fun because um, I, uh, when I produced the Blu-ray, I did 52 episode commentaries, uh, but there's 156 episodes total. And so I, I always have sort of had in the back of my head to do the remaining 104 because I have so many stories from the Twilight Zone, so much to share that isn't in the book because, I, you know, I interviewed over 100 people. I have over 100 hours of recorded interviews. I have, you know, I, it's like so much to share. And I thought, well, someday I'm going to get around to doing those. And, uh, you know, recently uh, I had the idea of raising some money to help my wife, Elaine, write, write, make one of her features. And I thought, well, why don't that seems like a great opportunity to raise like maybe 100 grand or whatever to to help her while also I can do those commentaries. And and I'll, I'll also do them with people who, who are still around who were in the episodes, such as Veronica Cartwright and also friends of mine like Neil Gaiman and, and so forth. Because um, I know many of the guys who are making the great shows of nowadays, Brandon Bragg and Ron Moore and so forth. I mean, mm -hmm. we're all Mark, my friend Mark Fergus, who uh, he created and show runs the uh, the show ran the Expanse or or Narain Shankar. I mean, mm -hmm. we all work with Sterling. Sterling was our model, our role model, and also you know our hero. And uh, he was really the first showrunner in the modern sense. And uh, you know, so we were all Twilight Zone fans. Whether it's David Chase with The Sopranos or 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 Matt Weiner with Mad Men, we all love Twilight Zone. We're all you know. 
it's like old home week when we sit down to watch an episode and talk about it. So I'm going to do the 104 episodes, and my plan is, uh, right now we've set up a website called twilightzonecommentaries.com where you can sign up to be notified when we, allow, when we open this up for sale. But the idea is for 49 bucks, you'll get audio commentaries of all 104 episodes that I haven't previously done. And oh, so wow. then you can, you can watch The Twilight Zone on whatever streaming service you subscribe to, or if you own the, the, the Blu-ray set, you can watch the episode with the sound off and just listen to me and whatever guest I have on that episode. And, uh, and so what we'll do is we're going to have a crowdfunding cam campaign, a Kickstarter campaign, and there's, it's got great perks. You know, I mean, it's not just those. I mean, if you want, if you, want you can... I'm, we're going we're to scan my, my archive of Twilight Zone material, and so for a higher price point, you can get the scan of everything in my files relating to Twilight Zone. Oh, wow. So that's, like, that's never been... You know, that's like me saying to someone, come into my house and let's go into the files. And you know, <laughs> I, have a, I have a file on every single episode of the Twilight Zone and, you know, and, and on and on. I mean, just amazing stuff. Hundreds of photographs uh, from the show. Just amazing things. Wow. Sounds there. like an ultimate database. Oh, oh yeah. And, the, and then also at a higher price point, you can have an episode dedicated to you. You can also ask questions that I'll answer in that commentary. And, and there's a, a high price point where you can actually do the commentary with me. And oh, so wow. That, going to be fun and uh you know so uh and and of course at some point you and i jp should probably do an episode that'd be that'd be super fun too oh yeah, yeah. that'd be a lot of fun I love well, that. I love we that. could do what well, you've probably already done people are alike uh all over no i don't think i have I don't oh think I, well that'd be a good one i would love to yeah, do that one it would that'd be <laughs> so, super fun i'm calling that's, dibs on that episode yeah. so, so the way i'm going to do it is um once a week for a year i'm going to um have on Mr. Sci-Fi a live streaming where I'll do two episodes and then at mm -hmm. the end of the year we'll bundle that into the archive and you know the all of them bundled 49 of them and send those to as a download to the people who purchased it and um, but it'll be a, it'll be this cool thing where people the, the people who who buy it, buy in can can watch it live streaming which will be very very fun with us you know reacting and um, and you never know who's going to be part of it i mean on any given episode i might you know call you know, some pal of mine, you know, a director from, you know, from Battlestar Galactica or whatever, you know, you never, you never know, or, you know, like, um, it's, and, and there are still a, f a number of people who worked on Twilight Zone who are still around, fewer and fewer, sadly, every year, but, um, but, you know, Bill Mummy remembers very clearly the, the three episodes he did, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Veronica Cartwright, it's very interesting, because that episode, I sing The Body Electric, it was about a children children who've lost their mom three three kids yeah, it was like a robot nanny or something yeah the, mm -hmm. the by of them a robot grandmother and when they shot that episode the actress they cast as the grandmother didn't work and so for months they were figuring out what to do and they finally recast the grandmother got the cast back together and shot those scenes that had her in them so actually it was shot twice to, to, to fix it to repair it so Veronica it'd be very interesting to hear Veronica Cartwright talk about that experience mm -hmm. of having to do that that episode with two different actresses you know so um very fun stuff but yeah so so we've set up twilightzonecommentaries.com so people can put in their email and when when we start the campaign they can go and pledge and uh, and you know I, i'm if, if, um, if i reach a hundred thousand bucks i'll do all the commentaries and you know so that's going to be very fun I, I feel confident that we can we can make that work and uh and you know and it, again it's so funny um I, had, I didn't know how, how much The Twilight Zone was ingrained in my brain yeah. until, you know, because I, when I finished the book, I really didn't watch Twilight Zone for over 20 years because I'd watched it so intensively. Mm -hmm. And then uh, PBS contacted me and they said, we're going to be doing a special on Rod Serling, American Masters. We're going to be shooting it in black and white and we want to interview you. So I thought, okay, well, I'll, you know, um, I'll bring The Twilight Zone companion with me, the book, in case I have to re refer to it, you know, because my, God knows what in, my memory's like after all these years. They filmed me for two and a half hours, and I never once opened the book. <laughs> and then I realized that it was hardwired up yeah. here. And the funny part is that I can watch any episode of The Twilight Zone, and it's usually less than a second before I can identify which episode it is. Mm -hmm. And it's almost always before any of the characters have spoken. And wow. So <laughs> That's like your version of Name That Tune. It's creepy. It's creepy. <laughs> yes. And, uh, but, but, the, but the thing is, it's like, the Twilight Zone really holds up. When I when I produced the Blu-ray and did the 52 commentaries with with Richard Donner and all these amazing people, um, Nightmare Twenty Thousand Feet. He directed that episode, so it's so great mm -hmm. to have the record of him now. 
and George Clayton Johnson. We did commentaries on all his episodes with him, and same with Earl Hamner. And so, um, but just, I, I was thinking, well, what would it be like to revisit this material all these years later? And it's, it holds up. It's great. It's it does just, hold up. You know, yeah. I mean, it's just fabulous. And, um, and the look of it, my God, you know, it's, it's, it's the cinematography is unparalleled. I mean, George Clemens came out of the golden age of Hollywood. You know, he'd worked on the Ruben Mamoulian, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as a camera operator. He'd been on Blood and Sand with Valentino, for God's sake. And so this guy really knew how to make a shot look phenomenal. And so, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's a jewel. It's, it's, a, it's a great show. Well, I have a question. It's something I think about a lot and I have no one really to, to, to comment about it with. So I want to know your thoughts. How did you feel on those episodes of The Twilight Zone where they switched from film to video recording? You know, the funny thing was for most, for decades, they, the way they syndicated them was they would transfer them to 16 millimeter film and they looked like just grainy kinescopes and you'd watch mm. them and you'd go, what the hell? What the hell is different with those? They're so odd. Yeah. And, um, and yet some of the episodes are great episodes, like Night of the Meek, the one with uh, Art Carney, who's playing a drunken department store Santa. What that was was during the second season of Twilight Zone, they were over budget, and they're trying to figure out ways to trim the budget. And they had this idea of doing episodes on videotape. So they chose six episodes. Now, the problem was that they had to all be shot inside. They couldn't go outside at all. They, and they had to shoot them in sort of like blocks of like 10 minutes to fill up like three blocks of 10 minutes. And so they hired uh, directors who knew, who had worked, come from live television, so they could work in that way. They would rehearse extensively, then shoot a section and then go on. And it was really, and switch from camera to camera live in, in, in while they were recording it. And um, it was on black and white videotape, which was very new at that point. And it, we're talking like around 1960. And, um, and by the time they'd done six, they realized that it just didn't work well with Twilight Zone because Twilight Zone needed that expansive uh, palette of going to being able to go to Death Valley or wherever, you know, yeah. as they required. But even so, they did Long Distance Call, which is a great Billy Mummy episode. They did The Whole Truth, um, which is about a car salesman who can't lie. There's mm -hmm. a honey car. They yeah. did 22, which was a great episode about a woman who sees, you know, room for one more, honey. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's the one. You know, and then um, also one called Static, which is about a guy who gets old radio broadcasts uh, from, from beyond, you know, earlier in time. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the cool part is that then for the home video and in more recent years in the syndication, they said, instead of airing the 16 millimeter, shitty looking 16 millimeter prints, let's go back to the video masters. And those, if you watch those on like the Blu-rays or on television, they're amazing. It's like really? watching, it's like watching live television. It's just amazing. Yeah, it's completely different in how it comes across from a regular Twilight Zone episode. It's got just a very different quality, and um, and it's just really pops. I mean, it's really interesting. You get to see Rod Serling on black and white videotape, or or Bill Mooney, or any of these actors. Um, it's really different. I, I highly recommend it if one hasn't seen those except in the scratchy, cruddy prints. Yeah, oh, I'll have to check that out because I do love when I see something yes. that's shot differently but in, but looks yeah. great. Like, yeah, you know, it, when, it, when they yeah. started upgrading old films to, to yeah. Blu-rays like The Godfather we, and things like that, they're like, wow, I've never yeah. seen it like this before. Yeah, well, when we, when we did the Blu-ray, <coughs> we went back to the, uh, the, the 35 millimeter negatives of of the episodes and boy they're gorgeous i mean and then they clean them up them up digitally as mm -hmm. well so they're they look better than when they were originally broadcast they're just phenomenal and um and the amazing thing is also they include the original coming attraction spots and unlike most shows which just have clips of the coming episode the attractions the coming attraction spots rod serling would be on camera and say next week we have this great episode by george clayton johnson blah 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 wow and that stuff and and the interstitials and all of that stuff <clears throat> really amazing and uh so it's uh it's really cool so but um rod was one of a kind i mean he was a giant and uh and that's why i want to do rod serling's after twilight again to bring him center stage but also the doing the commentaries again i can really point out a lot of stuff that, that the audience doesn't know and uh and i can't wait to do it it's going to be super fun it'll take a year to record all those all those oh comments. yeah that's a lot of episodes that you're that yeah. you're going to be taking on yeah. and then yeah. i have a question about uh the commentary from your point of view yeah. Yeah. Uh, for my own edification and anyone else sure. yeah. watching here 
uh, when you, being an expert, knowing everything about the Twilight Zone, more than yeah. you probably know you know until, <laughs> until it pops in your brain, yes. uh, when you do a commentary on the Twilight Zone, do you prepare or you just pop on yeah. an episode and you just know about it? Nope, 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 nope. Because because the, the, the one one's goal when doing a com, uh, commentaries is to not be. There's a term that we use, an idiot. You don't want to be an idiot, yeah. you know. So and and there's several traps that doing commentaries uh, um, can, you can fall into if you're not careful. And we all of us who've watched commentaries know this, which is describing what's about to happen. It's like, oh, he's going to open that door and it's going to be a monster. Well, clearly, whoever's listening to the commentary probably watched the episode or the movie first, so yeah. they know, they don't they don't need you narrating what's going to happen. And uh, the other one is <clears throat> falling into chit chat. Like there's uh, like for instance, the audio commentary on the thing with Kurt Russell and, and John Carpenter is terrific and very specific to what you're watching on screen. And yet on Big Trouble in Little China, they just fall into chit chat. Like, how are your kids, uh, John? Oh, oh well, wow. you know, Mary's going to college now. Really, Mary's going to college now. It's like, oh man. And it's just, and so you, you either can be just babbling, you're totally off the point, or you can just be describing what you're seeing on the screen. So you don't want to do either of those things. So the way I do it is I first research um, all about the director, all about the actors, all about the writers, um, anything that I might not have known at the time when I wrote the book. So for instance, you know, a director might subsequently have gone on to direct something like Dynasty or something, something that didn't exist. You know, I, the book came out in 82. And so I'll, I'll, I'll update it with the credits or some actor who, come, you know, like for instance, James Whitmore well, is in the Shawshank Redemption, which of course hadn't been made when I wrote the book. So, so I'll make it a point to comment on those kind of things and, the, and also the relevance, the connectivity between episodes. So for, if, for instance, one episode is a deal with the devil episode, I might talk about the other deal with the devil episodes they did on Twilight Zone. So I'll make a lot of notes. But also what I do with whoever I'm doing the episode with is we'll watch it once all the way through before we do the commentary. Mm -hmm. so that's where we can say, oh, okay, look at that. The, how, how did, you know, that shot's really interesting. And the guy might say, well, here's how we set that up. And so we know, and I'll make notes as I do that, and then we take a run at it. So I'm never doing it just like from a cold engine because, um, could, because if you do it from a cold engine, you might go, gosh, you know, I should, have, I should have asked about this thing or I should have talked about that or, you know, you'll, you'll miss opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so, so and, and maybe it's just that I'm very scrupulous, but, um, but I want to give as full value as I possibly can. I don't, I don't, I'm not arrogant. I don't ever rest on my laurels. I don't assume that just because I know a lot of stuff, I'm going to, you know, just be able to uh, wing it, you know, yeah. I mean, I, well, I'll wing it in interviews like this. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I don't have to read up on myself, but, <laughs> uh, you know, but, um, but when, when it's something like a commentary, I really want to give it my hundred percent, you know, my best. And, uh, um, and that's also when, even, even when I choose who I'm going to do the commentary with, I'm very, like, I'm very um, careful with that. Like, like for instance, Death's Head Revisited, which is possibly one of the greatest things written about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't know Rod Serling was Jewish. You know, a lot of people, you know, when, when he died, he, by, he listed his, um, uh, on the hospital form, he listed his uh, religion as, as uh, Unitarian. And so, um, but he was, he was Jewish. He was from a Jewish family and he felt the uh, Holocaust very profoundly. And so I reached out to Neil Gaiman because a lot of people don't know Neil's Jewish either. And, and I'm Jewish. And so, um, so to discuss from a Jewish perspective that episode, was really fun. And, uh, you know, so again, you know, you find those ways of, of kind of really uh, coming at it from, a, from an interesting angle. And, uh, and, and but, you know, and it's, and, and it's fun both to do commentaries with the people who worked on those shows. Mm -hmm. And it's also very fun to do commentaries with the people who became the giants of television and movies and, and books, you know, since, because they were inspired by Twilight Zone, because certainly no one writing science fiction, fantasy, or horror in any media uh, can uh, in any medium can uh, can not feel the influence of Rod Serling. You, it's it's pervasive, yeah. you know. And well, it was very funny because when I was story editing Friday the Thirteenth the series, freelancers would come in and they'd say, "Well, there's this um, um, uh, ventriloquist where his dummy's taking him over." And I go, "Boy, are you talking to the wrong guy? <laughs> you know? I know what you're ripping off." You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> like, you know? So that was that was always very amusing. Yeah. But um, but you know, but yeah, I mean, Twilight Zone just came up with such a wealth of wonderful wonderful ideas you know and wonderful characters well you know when you, earlier when you were talking about how rod serling you know the characters are so you, you still identify with them whether it's yeah. burgess meredith breaking his glasses as the last man on earth or Anne francis going into a department store and there's a floor that no one else knows about where the mannequins are coming the mannequins yeah yeah i mean rod had a great sympathy and empathy 
for little people, small people. Twilight Zone, for the most part, is not about presidents or, or, or generals. It's about the little people, the secretaries and the working, uh, regular working people and, and the foot soldiers, you know. And, and that's because that's where he identified, you know, he was a really nice guy, a really good guy. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Burgess, Burgess Meredith, when I interviewed Burgess Meredith for the book, he said, um, Rod Serling, like most good writers, listened a good deal more than he talked. And that's like, ah, oh, yeah, because he was always, and he had great interest in people, genuine interest. Mm -hmm. He wanted to know their stories, you know. Well, thinking back now, yeah, there's so many episodes of The Twilight Zone where it's just that normal, ordinary person yeah. probably it doesn't stand out at all, which they yeah. did, but they didn't. And then yeah. they get that opportunity. Sometimes yeah. it's an opportunity they wish they never got, like the Dick yes. York episode where yes. he flips the coin, it stands on, yeah. the, on the side. And, and, yes. and well, It's funny because George Clayton Johnson told me that he wanted to do a TV series that would follow that coin from week to week. And he had actually worked out a, a sequel storyline, which is the next guy who gets that telepathic coin. Uh, he's a poker player. And so he starts winning enormously at poker and then finally goes up and up and up to the most high stakes game with the most you know, successful poker player. And they bring that guy in and he's Chinese and he thinks in Chinese. <laughs> and, so he uh, and he doesn't understand Chinese. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, there's always those little fun little, like yeah. that one gunslinger episode where the guy wants to become the best gunslinger. He starts yeah. taking this potion, right. gets to the top guy and it turns right. out the other guy's also taking the potion. The potion. Yeah, yes. there's always that, uh, that twist. Nice. Yeah, they shoot each other in the hand, so yeah. they either dies, but they're both, you know, they'll both never draw a gun again. It's great, just great stuff. And again, um, but, the, but the fun part about Twilight Zone, something that I really love about it is it's not just about the gimmick because you can watch these episodes again and again and again because it has such a heart and it has such meaning. You know, mm -hmm. because that episode, it's Dan Duryea and he, you know, he wants a second chance and the second chance isn't becoming a great gunslinger again. It's becoming a man who doesn't have to use a gun anymore, who can't use a gun anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's such a lovely episode and so heartfelt and Rod did such a great job with it. And, and Dan Durier is the lead, he'd been, he'd been a movie star, but then you've got a young Martin Landau in it, you've got a young Doug McClure in it. I mean, it's so fun to see these actors, particularly Martin Landau. He's, yeah, he was the man in like, black, basically. Yeah, he's great in that episode. So, uh, and this is again, before Mission Impossible and before Space 1999 or, or, or Ed Wood, you know, uh, so he's, early in his career and that's that's part of the fun of it yeah and of course we got to see uh william shatner in a couple episodes early yes. in his career which <laughs> yeah. were, uh you know everyone loves the uh nightmare, nightmare at Twenty Thousand feet yeah. but i love the other one with nick of time with, yeah, yeah nick, of time. nick of time where it's the fortune telling little machine <laughs> at the diner yes. i absolutely love that one because it's the whole message is you know your own doubts actually taking yeah. over Yes. Uh, your actions. And that's one of the few episodes that actually doesn't have a fantasy element, interestingly enough. It's like an episode that could actually take place in uh, the objective reality of the world because it's people who fall under the sway of that thing, but it's, it's, left ve it's very subtle and, mm -hmm. uh, and very, very fun. It's a, it's a very fun episode. And Shatner, is, this, again, this is before Star Trek, both of those episodes, and, uh, and Shatner has such intensity. You know, he's, he's really great in both of those roles. If, if, if the actor didn't have that kind of, you know, frantic energy yeah. uh, it wouldn't work and so they were very careful in how they cast the roles you know very they cast them very specific to what the the script and the character uh, required and as and again you you just you know Burgess Meredith was talking about in time enough at last where he breaks the glasses he said uh, you know almost more than anything else he'd done in his career he was always mentioned for that you know mm -hmm. and particularly in television you know and uh, I mean the the you wouldn't tend to get that level of actor generally in a, in the average TV show back then. It was it was the scripts were so great that the actors just said, "Well, okay, normally I, I don't work for this amount of money, or, or I don't work work in TV, but boy, oh boy, I mean, I can't pass this one up." Yeah, you they know? actually get to do their the, their job that they want to do, yeah, <laughs> yeah, which they yeah. don't always get to do in in other types of projects. Oh, well, they get to and and often they cast. Um, actors against type so they might have a they often they cast comedians in serious roles like game of pool where they have jonathan winters you know yeah and he, jonathan winters and it's so fun to see him in that with jack klugman i mean my gosh i want another one that george clayton johnson wrote that one and it's another great episode so yeah wonderful stuff yeah absolutely and i really appreciate uh getting a little insight into 
how you set up a commentary because that's something that's been on my list for a long time to do Orville com fan commentaries, yes, yes, but I want yes. to do them right. I want to provide yeah. enough, uh, information and, yeah. you know. Yeah, because you want to give added value. You don't just want to be saying, you know, I mean, it's, but I see so many people fall into that trap. There, there are some people who do great commentaries. Guillermo del Toro is terrific. He does great commentaries on his work. And, but again, you have to really think about it beforehand and say, okay, what do I want to talk about? what's going to be meaningful. And the real, the two things that really are meaning, well, there's three things. The three things that are meaningful are background on the creative personnel. So if you say, oh, well, this actor was also in such and such show or this and that, you know, mm -hmm. you're filling that in. Then there's like how they made it. Like for instance, the fact that Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, uh, they, that was shot in a real airplane fuselage. They couldn't, there were no wild walls. So they had to use handheld cameras because they couldn't pull back the way they normally would. Um, and then, and then the third thing is, is, um, um, uh, things relating to genre, relating to, to the kind of the more, the more academic things where you're talking about, as I said, deals with the devil or mm -hmm. second chances or those kind of larger uh, thematic issues. But again, when you're weaving it in with the making of and, and, back, and actual background, then it doesn't come across as just someone, you know, a blowhard, you know, make it, having a theory. You know? Yeah, because you don't want to do a commentary where you're just like, oh, I love this part. Check it out. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Let's just, let's just watch the scene together uh, yeah. in silence. You know, it's, oh, that was so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's cool. Uh, yeah. Wow, those are great visual effects, man. Oh man, I wonder how they did them. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, maybe someone will do another commentary. You know, it's like, uh, but yeah, but it's it's uh, but but see, I think we're living in a golden age of commentaries because you know, Blu-rays and DVDs really allowed to have these making of featurettes and these commentaries mm. that you could get this amazing amount of material on how this these phenomenal TV shows and movies were made and I don't know if that's going to continue into the future I mean you know DVD and Blu-ray is kind of a dying uh, format now that we have you know downloads and all of that and I don't know if we're gonna if that's this is going to continue but I hope it does because as a historian of television uh, and science fiction, I, that stuff's precious. Just, I mean, the fact that when I was doing the Twilight Zone Companion, I found videotapes of Rod Serling teaching classes where he would show an episode and then talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if not for me finding that stuff, it would have been lost, I mean, forever. Yeah. And finding it, I was able to quote it and also put it in the Blu-rays and DVDs. And, you know, it's, it's, it's precious. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, well, I've actually thought about that. And I think the future of commentaries and featurettes and all that stuff is all just going to be online. You go to that movie's YouTube page and it's yeah. there on a list. Or if it's on Hulu, you know, the movie's yeah. there, but then there's the extras yeah. section. You have to I click so. down there and you, and you see yeah. that stuff there. But yeah, the the whole DVD extras and Blu-ray extras are, are, are we got to appreciate them now because yeah. they're not going to be around forever. Yeah, and you know, and 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 also there's some stuff like YouTube, which I love. I mean, YouTube is my favorite network because yeah. back when I wrote the Twilight Zone Companion, I had to go to universities and put stuff, put 16 millimeter or 35 millimeter prints on a moviola to watch stuff. Mm -hmm. And now you just click on YouTube, and there a lot of it is. It's all there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I, yeah, I love I love the for, the the format because it's like everybody who wants one gets a t their own TV network that they can yeah. program. Yes. Well, that's how I have my Mr. Mr. Sci-Fi YouTube channel. I mean, that was just Glenn Mazzara recommended, said, you know so much about science fiction, you should have your own YouTube channel. It's not something that, that I would have thought of originally, but I love having it. It's so much fun. Yeah, and, you, you can put and, up what, and talk about whatever you want to talk about. And you yeah. know a lot of things, and you can talk about a lot of things. Yes, and also authenticity is prized, you know, where I, because in TV, when I started, you would write the script, and the show would be your communication with the audience. But now they get to see who we are as people and, and see the, the, how that um, becomes the work, the writing, and so forth. They get to see the whole, every stage of the process if they want. And I think that's just terrific. I love that. So it's really fun. Yeah, absolutely. And in and, and your channel, I mean, you're always, you know, communicating and talking about sci-fi and what you think about, you know, other people's sci-fi, your own sci-fi, Space <laughs> Command. So fun. It's yeah. so fun. I love it. And, and you know, and I even, even several of my movies, uh, my favorite movies that have fallen into the public domain, I was actually able to air them on Mr. Sci-Fi and then do my commentary on the, like, Things to Come, which is a movie that H.G. Wells wrote that came out in 1936. I was able to present it on Mr. Sci-Fi and do a commentary of it as well. And so to be able to share that with, with my audience who may not even be aware of H.G. Wells having written one of the great science fiction movies of the 20th century, 
um, is just it's just too cool. You know, it's it's really fun, and so I don't. I'm, I'm, I feel very blessed in my life between having Elaine and having my own studio and having wonderful people like you, JP, and <laughs> you know, it's like every well, day is Christmas you. for me. Every day is Christmas. So I'm, 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 I'm speaking no of, I can't wait for Christmas. Yes. I, I hope to get a Twilight Zone box set for Christmas hey, this year. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> yeah, no, that it's it's wonderful that we can watch the show as it was intended to be watched. You know, so yeah, it's um. That's really a blessing. I mean, uh, the fact that movies, you know, again, movie, you know, when you watch TV in the old days, it looked like shit. I mean, the, the were shitty prints, 60 millimeter prints with scratches. And, and often if, it, if, it, if the film had broken, they would just splice mm. it back and they'd have these jumps. And you know, the fact that you can just watch them pristine. Yeah. So and even if they were pristine back then, you had to rely on your t television antenna reception. Yes, yes. <laughs> which, was, which didn't help at all either. Terrible. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I'm, I think we, we have many, many blessings to be thankful for. And so it's yeah. great. So it's great. It's great seeing you, JP. It's, it's great, great seeing you. And I think everybody, all sci-fi fans out there, Twilight Zone fans, Space Command fans, Star Trek fans, anything sci-fi related fans, yeah. uh, people who are fans of writing as yeah. well. You need yeah. to check out Mr. Sci-Fi on YouTube. Mark Zikri is a wealth of knowledge and wealth of commentary and opinions. Yes. And it's where he, it's where I go. It's where you need to go as well if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, when you're not hanging out here on Egotastic exactly. Fun Time. Exactly. I, th I think between the two of us, we can pretty much fill up someone's calendar. You know, so. <laughs> try. My calendar's been pretty full lately. I've been putting out yeah. just tons of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, but the, I, I, like, I like the fact that we generally love this, you yeah. know, it's not, it's not of cynicism. It's not like, well, someone hired us to do this. It's a, it's a job and we'll, we'll just do whatever. No, we love it. And I think, I think all really great things come from that love, all, all great creative expressions, all great everything. You mm -hmm. know, so I think we're both doing it for the right reason. Yeah. I, I, and there's been moments, you know, throughout my years of doing this where I'm like, Oh God, you got, you know, this and that, or it's too, it's hard or it's not working yeah. out. And then yeah. there'll be another time where I'm filming something, writing something, editing something. And I'm like, Oh, this is fun. I love this. Yeah. Why yeah, did, yeah. I must've been just having a bad day. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's also something that, that I think is important to share with people, you know, that writing or any endeavor, it's going to be difficult and you're not always going to be inspired. You're not always going to be enthusiastic, but it's the, it's, it's over time. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it takes effort to make anything, you know, Yeah. but, but at least we're not Michelangelo working on a piece of marble and he hits his hand hits wrong and he goes, fuck. Yeah. It's, it's done. messed up forever. <laughs> bring me uh, some spackle. <laughs> yeah. Bring, bring, bring the next 40 foot, uh, chunk of marble, <laughs> you know, uh, start over, you know, yeah. But, yeah. So, well, it's been lovely sharing time with you, JP. Absolutely. So. I was so excited. I was so excited that, that you wanted to talk about the Twilight Zone. Anytime. I, I never have anyone to talk about the Twilight Zone with, so uh, no, I very no. much appreciated it. Egotastic fun time. We're going to have a great time. Egotastic fun time. Give me all your money. Give him all your money. You will find me funny. Just give me money. I love money. Give me all your money! Give me all your money! Give me all your money! Give me all your money!